Now that means in, in that hundred yards that the enemy have got to cover to get to the British line, there's a total of 1,600 rounds coming down against that frontage of 150 yards. So 10 bullets per yard of front. Nobody, nobody is going to advance through that. They simply can't. Now, the poor old French doing the attacking, they're attacking in column. They can fire. Only the front two ranks can fire. You can't reload on the move. So they'll have one volley of 300 rounds against a frontage of 400 yards. So that's less than one round per yard of front. So the mathematics are obvious. Line versus column. The line wins every time. Hello and welcome to this week's pod. My name's Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. Today is the big one. It's the anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, the 18th of June, 1815. And I have the major back, Gordon Corrigan, to talk us through what happened. We talk the state of the French army, Napoleon, the Allied army, the Prussians, the mistakes and the myths. It's all here, including the reason for the British or Allied victory, which you heard at the top there. Disciplined volleys from the line fired at the French columns. Gordon's book was a bestseller when it came out, and though there have been many written about the battle, you're unlikely to find a better account. We taught Wellington, the commander of the cavalry Uxbridge, and rather interestingly, why people had their teeth taken out on their 21st birthday in those days. Plenty more content coming up, including the troubles with Peter Taylor, and the Eastern Front with Ian McGregor, the film club is Bloody Sunday. In the meantime, I'm going to hand you over to me talking with Gordon Corrigan on Waterloo. Welcome back, Gordon Corrigan. I've been quite a um, uh, developing quite a relationship on this podcast, Gordon. And today we're going to be dealing with the big one. Waterloo and any remaining French listeners, I, I think we're, we're I'm, I'm down to single numbers now, French listeners, but Gordon, welcome. Thank you very much. It's very good to be back. And so you're, you're an expert in this because you've written a book, Waterloo, A New History of the Battle and Its Armies. And this is going to be going out at the anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo this year. Uh, it really was the the battle to end all battles really what jack was a nickname it was given wasn't it yes i think rather wrongly i mean every schoolboy knows two things about history uh the battle of waterloo and 1066 1066 know the date don't know what happened battle of waterloo knows the battle don't know when it was but it's generally i think seen as a an overwhelmingly marvelous british victory against overwhelming odds i think realistically it was an allied victory against odds that weren't that bad, uh, in, in fact. And that's not always a popular opinion. But if you look at the figures and look at the how the thing developed, um, the odds actually weren't terribly, terribly bad at all. Yeah, the French had more men on the field, but they had to do the attacking. What people tend to forget is that Napoleon needed a fast victory. Napoleon's got problems. He's come back, he's reorganized the, the Grand Armée, but there is still suspicion in the ranks between the mid-level officers uh, who got chucked out without a pension when, when the Bourbons came back, and the senior officers who turned their coats, worked quite happily for the Bourbons, and then turned their coats again when Napoleon came back from, from Elba. So there is suspicion. Uh, oh, I thought the whole French army everyone was getting on well because they loved Napoleon so much. No, they yes, the junior rank certainly did. And to be fair, so did the senior officers. But they had nevertheless, the vast majority of them had worked quite happily under the Bourbons when the Bourbons came back. And then, of course, when Napoleon came back, they, they couldn't resist the charisma of their old emperor. And of course, they, they turned coats again. And if you were, say, a lieutenant colonel or a major who was chucked out when the Bourbons came back without a pension, despite having been promised one, uh, and you were finding it pretty rough for, for that period, for that 100 days. But the marshals are still being paid, still being employed by the Bourbons. Ney commanded the Bourbon cavalry. In fact, they, they all basically took jobs under, under, under the Bourbons. 
uh, you would, and then back comes Napoleon, you, Lieutenant Colonel Major, you're off the streets, you're back in the army, and you're a bit pissed off with, with the generals who have been being paid and have turned their coats twice. Uh, so so there, there, is, there is this. There's also problems back in Paris. Uh, where not all the populace are glad to see Napoleon back. The majority are largely the fault of the Bourbons. If the Bourbons had any sense at all, Napoleon would never have been able to come back. But the trouble—they so didn't was, have any sense, did they? The Bourbons? No, they they tried to go back to as it was, you know, before the revolution. If they'd recognised that not all was bad about the revolution, that there were certain things that were good and certain things that that they they shouldn't try and overturn. They could well have ruled over a happy and contented state, but they didn't do that. They they tried to go back to, to pre-revolutionary days, and that simply wasn't acceptable. So what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is, is Napoleon comes back, uh, and he is welcomed by the vast majority of the population. But there are doubts. People like Fouché, Napoleon should have had Fouché executed. Fouché was the minister of police, very important position. Uh, back in Paris, and he was he was betting both ways. He was keeping in touch with the Bourbons, just in case it went the other way. So the solution to all this, this this suspicion within the ranks, this this um, slightly dubious attitudes back in Paris with the politicians, is a quick victory. If he can get a quick victory, then everything's fine again. You know, he's he's won the war. He's he's the emperor, and everything's fine. So he needs a quick victory. Wellington doesn't. Wellington can continue to move, maneuver, and maneuver and maneuver uh, until he finds someone that will absolutely suit him. Um, he's not in a rush. Napoleon is. Napoleon has to fight this battle, and he has to win it. And he does have more men on the field uh, than Wellington, but he's got to be the the attacker. He he can't simply defend. He, he needs this quick victory, and that means he's got to attack. And the rule of thumb, then, and indeed, very roughly, now it doesn't really change very much, is if you're the attacker, you need three times as many as the as the defender for all sorts of reasons. And he didn't have anything like three times as many. He had something like uh, 60,000 infantry, uh, 78,000 men altogether, 60,000 infantry, 15,000 cavalry. The Anglo-Dutch army, commanded by Wellington, has around 49,000, just over 49,000 infantry. So, yeah, Nolan's got more, but but really not enough to, to ensure a, a victory. The only thing that he does outnumber the Anglo-Dutch in is guns. The, the French have got 246 guns of various calibres in the field, artillery pieces. The Anglo-Dutch have 157. But that's mm -hmm. the only arm in which he outnumbers the Allies significantly. And artillery alone, vital support weapon, but artillery alone is not going to win a battle. So that is why I say that the odds actually weren't all that bad. And I say an allied victory because Wellington's army was, was a real United Nations. I mean, he had Dutch, he had Germans, he had Belgians. Admittedly, the British were the largest national contingent, but they were a minority in the in the in the whole the whole battle, or the whole army. Uh, it, it was very much a, a, an Anglo-Dutch-German army. To say nothing, of course, of the of the Prussians. I mean, the Prussian army is 120,000 strong. Napoleon lost the battle on the 16th of June, in my, in my view. He lost it two days previously. He lost it to the Battle of, of Ligny. When he failed, to, he defeated the Prussians at Ligny, but he didn't force them back to Germany. The Prussians were able to leave the field to reorganize, thanks to Neisner, their chief of staff. Poor old Blucher was unconscious on a horse being led off the field. Neisner, who didn't trust the British, actually, didn't actually like the British. Neisner was quite convinced that the British, if it suited them, would, would leave the continent and scuttle back to England. He was probably right. Uh, but Neisner had been told by Blucher that whatever happened, Neisner was to keep in touch with the British and was to continue to support the British. So against his better judgment, Blucher being unconscious, Neisenau sent out staff officers to every crossroad, stopped German parties wherever they were going, said, right, head north, head north, head north. He told them all to head to, to Vavre, because Vavre, given the appalling, I mean, this was at night, and the appalling maps that the only 
town they could really identify was Vavra. So, d- and go how north. far was that from um, Waterloo? Well, that was only a bite eight miles from Waterloo, but but the road is appalling. I mean, part of the old road is still there and is absolutely appalling. So eventually, when the Prussians start to move a corps, the one corps that hadn't been involved in Ligny, across to support Wellington, it takes ages because the road is so bad. In fact, they have to abandon their, their heavy guns at one stage, their 12-pounders, because they couldn't get, they get them down the hill, so they couldn't get them back up again. So that's where Napoleon has lost the campaign. He's failed to drive the Prussians off the field. The Prussians can reorganize. They're still there. Had Napoleon been able to disperse the the Prussians completely, I still actually don't think he'd won the battle because the, the Wellington wouldn't have fought it. People sometimes say to me, could Wellington have won Waterloo without the Prussians? And my answer is, that's the wrong question. Yes, it he was his plan. Fought the battle. He'd never have fought the battle if he didn't know the Prussians were coming to support him. And he didn't make the decision to fight the battle until three o'clock in the morning of the 18th of June when um, he has a message from Blucher saying, I'm send at least one corps to support you in the morning. That's when he decides he's fight the battle. Well, just so, before we get to the battle, Gordon, yeah. Napoleon carries out some quite brilliant manoeuvres to get to the stage where he splits the two armies or he is able to man- uh, manoeuvre his army in between the Prussians and the, and the allies. Is that, is, and was, was that, am I right in saying that's, that was Napoleon being brilliant Napoleon? Well, Napoleon has a simple choice. He's, he's got back. He's the emperor of France once again, but he can't just sit there in Paris and do nothing. There's a huge Russian army on the way. There's a huge Austrian army on the way. The Prussians and the Anglo-Dutch are already in Flanders. So he's got to do something. Who's the real threat? It's not the British army, which is tiny. It's British money and British ships. The blockade, British money. Britain is financing all, all the coalitions against Napoleon, all eight of them were financed by England. England is the richest country in the world, and it's England's pockets that he's worried about. So, so England is the main, if he can knock England out of the war, he thinks the British will scuttle back to England, the government will fall, a Whig government will come in, who will make, which will make peace. Now, that was his thinking. That he, he what he failed to realize is that being kicked out of Europe just makes the British more bolshy and more grumpy, not less. And if Napoleon had studied history a bit more carefully, he'd have discovered that. But but that's his thinking, and that's why he decides he's got to get his blow in first. If he sits there, he's he's had it. They're all going to descend on him and crush him. So his thinking is get down to Flanders, split the Prussians and the and the British or the Anglo-Dutch, defeat one of them one at a time. If if they can, if they combine, they, they, he can't beat them. There are far too many of them. But if he can defeat them individually, then he, he can take them on. So that's his thinking. Now, the Anglo-Dutch army and the Prussian army, the way they were deployed was to advance into France. That's, that's their intention. So they weren't deployed in a defensive formation. They were deployed ready to go into to, to invade France. And all they were waiting for was for the Russians to turn up because they've got the furthest to come and they're trudging along uh, to get to the, the French borders. So that's why the uh, why Napoleon was, was relatively easily was able to send part of his army to take on uh, the Anglo-Dutch at Quatre Bras while he took on the Prussians at, at Ligny. And then when he's defeated the, the Prussians at Ligny, He says to Grouchy, take 34,000 troops and make sure the Prussians get in between them. Keep a sword in the back. Don't let them combine. And Grouchy gets that wrong. Instead of Grouchy getting himself in between them, which he might well have been able to do. Oh, right. So Grouchy does slightly bog it. It's not, it's not, it wasn't an impossible task that Napoleon set him. It wasn't an impossible task. I think if Grouchy had got in between the Prussians, then it would it would have been fairly quickly clear to Wellington what had happened, and Wellington would have scarpered. I mean, he, he doesn't have to fight at Waterloo. He'll manoeuvre until he finds another position that's that's suitable. He's not in a rush. It's it's Napoleon. It's, Napoleon needs, as I keep saying, Napoleon's got to have a quick victory. It's the only solution. 
And if he doesn't have a quick victory, he's had it. Either his empire will collapse internally, uh, or eventually the Royal Navy will blockade him, which they're going to do anyway, and eventually the whole thing will fall apart. He needs this quick victory. Well, you've mentioned Catrabra, which was a battle beforehand that Napoleon wasn't present at. Instead, I think he leaves it to Marshal Ney. Yep. Who should Marshal of Ney should have won Catrabra, shouldn't he? Well, Ney had fought Wellington in the peninsula. He, Ney. And we love Ney, that. don't we? We love Ney. Um, yeah, he was a jolly good sergeant. I'm not sure he was anything more than that, really. This is the problem with Napoleon's senior leadership. Come the revolution, there are something like 300 generals in the French army. All but five of them are either executed, jailed, or they've legged it. They've, they've, they're in exile. Uh, something like 40% of the junior officers, colonel and below, are gone, executed, jailed, exiled. Napoleon appoints 26 marshals. Of those, 11 of them are ex-NCOs, including Ney, Sult, Davo, they're all ex-sergeants. Now, in any army, you need captains and you need sergeants. They're not interchangeable. Their whole mindset, the way they're trained, the way they're developed is completely different. And in very, very simple terms, officers decide policy and sergeants carry it out. I mean, that, there's far more to it than that, but, but in, in very general terms. Uh, and when you try to when they try to do each other's jobs, it frequently doesn't work. The sergeant actually will probably do the captain's job rather better than the captain will do the sergeant's job. Um, but the problem with these chaps, uh, 11 of them are ex-NCOs, seven of them had no experience at all until the revolution came along. And they became soldiers or officers in, in revolutionary armies. Seven of them had been junior officers of the Bourbons, lieutenants, as indeed had Napoleon. Only one, only one general survived from pre-revolution period. Uh, and even he was not entirely trusted. That was that was Kellerman Sr. So you've got these the core commanders, these, these, the marshals, brave as lions. Terribly good at letting, leading men into the jaws of death, and far too often it was into the jaws of death. They, they weren't staff trained. They didn't really understand how to manage a campaign. They knew how to fight at, at the local level, but they didn't really understand the management of a campaign. That, that is one of Napoleon's big problems. Yes, he does start a sort of staff training scheme, but it hasn't really got going. There are, there are hard, I mean, Berthier was really the only properly staff trained officer that that survived and come the revolution he was he was jailed and then they didn't execute him he was reduced to the rank of private he had been a colonel a lieutenant colonel i think and he's he's in and they say right uh, we're very short of staff officers you've got to be a staff officer again but you'll stay as a lieutenant and he said no thanks and eventually the revolution sort of <laughs> relent and he gets his old rank back but he ends up as napoleon's chief of staff where and he much of Napoleon, the credit for Napoleon's victories are down to Berthier. He, he was the manager. I mean, Napoleon would say, we will go and attack whatever, Austria. And Berthier would then work it out, how many troops you need, what routes you need to go on, how much ammunition you need, where you need to set up depots, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Come Napoleon's return in 1815, Berthier doesn't want to play. And Berthier is pushed off to Bamberg, which is now in Germany. Uh, to his wife's home. His wife was a was a, a member of the the royal household of of Bamberg. Uh, he's not going to play. So Napoleon selects Soult. Now Soult was a good plain cook in military terms, if you like. He was an ex drill sergeant. He was probably one of the better commanders. I mean, in Spain, his army keeps getting an awful kicking, scattered to the wilds. And then in a couple of days, he's got the army reorganized again. So he's he's not a bad guy to command a corps, but he's not a he's not a chief of staff. I mean, he he just doesn't understand the management of a campaign. And to give an example, Berthier, whenever he was sending orders, first of all, he never allowed Napoleon to write anything, or he never allowed something written by Napoleon to go straight to a subordinate commander because Napoleon's handwriting was almost illegible. So Berthier would get the written piece of paper from Napoleon, rewrite it in his own legible handwriting, and he would send it out with three 
different messengers. So if one of them got killed, the other got lost, one at least would get through. Soult allowed Napoleon to send his directly written uh, instructions to corps commanders, which is part of the reason uh, that Ligny was, was essentially a cock-up, because um, at one stage in the fight against the Prussians, Napoleon wants some um, Ney's reserve, which has not yet been employed, commanded by Delon, to come across from Quatre Bras to get in behind the Prussians. Now, if they'd done that, <laughs> the result of the battle might have been very different because the Prussians wouldn't have been able to escape to the north. They'd have had to head back to, to Germany. Now, unfortunately, because of Napoleon's appalling handwriting, uh, Derlon reads it as the wrong village. And instead of getting in behind the Prussians, he in fact gets in in front of them. And for a while, the Napoleon thinks that it's it's Prussians or British or somebody. Who the hell is it? And uh, Ney, by this stage, uh, discovers that his whole Derlon's corps, his reserve corps, is, is gone. Nobody has told Ney. <laughs> Ney sends a message to Derlon and says, what are you doing? Get back here. So Derlon starts moving back towards Cattrebral. And Napoleon sends another message to him saying, what are you going to get back here? So poor old Derlon spends the whole afternoon of the 16th of June marching backwards and forwards and achieving absolutely nothing. Berthier would never have allowed that to happen. Berthier, first of all, would go through the chain of command, which is what you should do. He'd have gone to Ney, the army commander, and said, release your corps. Ney would then have told Derlon to get going. Berthier would have rewritten Napoleon's written instruction so Derlin would have arrived where he should have arrived. So, so this is an example of, of the fact that the staff organization at the Battle of Waterloo, or the whole campaign, was unsatisfactory. So it wasn't up to it. He was a perfectly decent chap, but he wasn't a staff officer. And, and we see that as the battle develops. So it just isn't up to it. Yeah, I mean, it's from what you're just saying, it sounds bordering, so bordering on incompetent. Yeah, some of them were. I mean, as an example, the Napoleon's plan, which was a perfectly good plan, he it's been pouring with rain, pouring with rain all the night of the 17th, 18th. The ground is a is a morass. I mean, it can't be much fun for the troops. No, it certainly wasn't. There's no nice billets to go into. It's all very well for Napoleon, who who has a very comfortable little billet. It's, it's still there. But but the soldiery are outside, some of them in tents, many of them not in tents, both sides simply wrapped up in a ground sheet, pouring with rain. And Napoleon was a gunner. Napoleon understood artillery. And the question is, why didn't he attack straight up the road at first light? Well, the reason is that he wanted to use his artillery and his artillery couldn't get off the road until the ground dried out because the wheels would, would sink in the mud. So the start of the battle is put off, put off, put off. The plan is that once the ground dries out a bit, the artillery will be deployed. There'll be a whacking great artillery bombardment all along the line, which incidentally doesn't have very much effect because Wellington puts his men on the reverse slope, as he always did. That was his, that was his tactic. And then Napoleon would attack Hougemont Farm. Now, Hougemont Farm is on the right of Wellington's flank. And it's a stout farm building. It was 200 years old at the time of the battle. And the idea is that if you could take that, which was where Wellington's right flank was anchored, you take that, you've got a jumping off spot to attack Wellington's right flank. Also, if we attack Wellington's right flank, he will reinforce it. And the only way he can reinforce it is by weakening the centre or his left, probably his centre. And when he does that, then we attack straight up the centre. Perfectly sensible. Good good plan. Doesn't work because, first of all, the artillery bombardment really doesn't have much effect. Wellington's chaps are on the reverse slope. Uh, and also the ground hasn't dried out that much. So the idea where you could skip a cannonball and it would kill three men, skip a bit more, kill another eight and so on, uh, didn't work because they tended to go straight into the mud. But when they attacked Hougemont Farm on the right, they didn't manage to take it. And instead of Soult realizing that and saying, right, stop, he didn't. And a whole of Ray's corps, virtually the whole of Napoleon's left flank almost, is taken up all day trying to take Hougemont Farm. Now, those troops would have been far better used somewhere else. Now, what would normally have happened, a good staff officer would have communications from the farm back to the headquarters. 
realised the first attack hadn't happened, hadn't succeeded, we're not going to attack it, right, stop. Wellington is not weakening his centre to reinforce. He's perfectly happy with what he's got in there. Stop. Well, that doesn't happen. Silt from the command post that, that Napoleon had in the centre of his line, he couldn't actually see who's going to But normally, a, a competent staff officer would have had ADCs, would have had men on fast horses in all these places who'd be coming back saying, this is what's happening, taking instructions back, bringing back reports, etc. That didn't happen. So the whole of Ray's Corps wasted, trying to all day trying to take Ujimont Farm and fails. And when the attack up the centre happens, because it still happens, although the centre hasn't been weakened, and this is using Derlon's Corps, the chap who spent all day on the 16th doing very little except march back and forwards, and that simply didn't work because the, the British infantry on the reverse slope were able to come forward and what Wellington used to describe as his clockwork volleys, and we can talk about that in a minute because that's very important uh, in yes. terms of British yes. tactics, just blew them away. Yeah, their rate of fire, they were very, very uh, fast. Is it three shots a minute where the French could only achieve two? Well, no, two is more realistic. Never mind sharp. You might... <laughs> You I have to confess, get... most of my yeah. knowledge is from Sharp. Ah, well, <laughs> yes. I don't actually object to Sharp if it makes people wonder what really happens. <laughs> it's, it's quite a good thing. Smooth bought musket, just what both sides. Is it are. called the Brown Bess? Well, the English one is called the Brown Bess. Uh, and really, it's the same. It came into service in 1702, and really, it hasn't changed. It's inherently inaccurate. And because it's muzzle loading, um, the, the, the sensible rate of fire is two rounds a minute. Now, you might get three rounds in the initial volley because you've loaded it before you get to the field. So you might get three rounds. But but two rounds is the is the sensible figure to work on. About one round in seven appears to be a misfire for one reason or another. Powder in the pan gets wet or, or whatever. So if, you, if you've only got two rounds a minute, and you, your range is 100 yards, realistically, at most. Over 100 yards, not going to hit anything. Uh, it, people used to say you're absolutely safe with somebody firing a musket, provided he's aiming at you. <laughs> it doesn't miss. So the only way to get far, far down is to pack soldiers shoulder to shoulder and fire in volleys. And we're looking at 100 yards. Now, if, you can, if your rate of fire is only two rounds a minute, and your enemy is 100 yards away, and you all fire your muskets off at once, it's going to take you 30 seconds to reload, and in 30 seconds, the enemy is going to be absolutely on you with a bayonet. So you have to have some means of, of fire coming down all the time. And what the British had developed, a thing called platoon firing. Now, it's a slight misnomer because the term platoon now today is a tactical unit. It, it wasn't then. Then a battalion consisted of 10 companies each company was 80 men so total of of 800 if the battalion was up to strength most of them weren't up to strength but but let's assume they were for the to explain the how the system worked so you've got 10 companies the fire unit was a half company so you've got 20 half companies each company was commanded by a captain so the captain would command one of the half companies and a lieutenant would command the other and there were various ways of doing it, but, but the simplest way was you have your battalion lined up in two ranks, 20 fire units. The two outside fire units of 40 men each, they fire. And then the next lot, fire. The next lot, fire. The next lot, and so on. And by the time you get to the two centre half companies firing, the two outside ones have reloaded. So you've got constant fire coming down. Now, there were other ways of doing it, but the simplest way was to start the outside and work in. You could start the inside and work out or whatever. So it's never the entire line fires off all at the same no, time. Never ever. Really never ever. Yeah. Uh, now, provided the half company commander could count to three seconds, uh, and never mind the mathematics, trust me, it's, it's, as long as there's a three second pause, then the thing works and you can go on firing forever until you run out of ammunition. And there's only one occasion in the whole of the Peninsular War of a unit running out of ammunition. So they didn't have stopwatches, of course, in those days. Some people had watches that were very, very expensive. So they had all sorts of mnemonics for remembering three seconds. You know, it'd be bang, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, bang. 
sergeant's wives, East Chilean pies, officer's wives, skillet, bang. You know, there, there are all sorts of little numbers. So the three second poles. Now that meant there was fire coming down all the time. So if you're in a defensive position, a British battalion, a defensive position, nobody is going to continue cracking at you with that sort of firing coming down. I mean, the mathematics of it, if you've got a, let us say you've got a, a French regiment, three battalions attacking a British one battalion. So as far as the British are concerned, every three seconds, there's a volley, there's 80 rounds coming down because two, the two half companies are firing. Now that means in, in that hundred yards that the enemy have got to cover to get to the British line, there's a total of 1,600 rounds coming down against that frontage of 150 yards. So 10 bullets per yard of front. Nobody, nobody is going to advance through that. They simply can't. Now, the poor old French doing the attacking, they're attacking in column. They can fire. Only the front two ranks can fire. You can't reload on the move. So they'll have one volley of 300 rounds against a frontage of 400 yards. So that's less than one round per yard of front. So the mathematics are obvious. Line versus column, the line wins every time. And provided your soldiers are trained to stand and to load and fire and load and fire, the British Army was the only army, the only army which actually issued live ammunition in training. Everybody else to save money. The French, for example, issued pieces of wood instead of flint to the, in, in the flintlock because it saved money enough to purchase flints. The British spent a long time. And now remember, the British is the only professional army in this game. Everyone but Napoleon, Nap I, I, I do see that, of course. And it's superior training. And that's why, you know, ultimately the victory is achieved. But Napoleon was a smart man he must have known this napoleon remember had never faced wellington and napoleon did say he's a mere CPR. yeah why did he underestimate um, wellington so much yeah i mean he'd been warned uh, at his at his breakfast before the battle he said he, he's reported as saying to his general you're all frightened of him because he's beaten you all in the peninsula he's not he's a he's a mere sepoy general this will be an affair this will be called le déjeuner, le petit déjeuner. This will be like breakfast. I think he probably had to say that. I mean, he's not going to say, yeah, absolutely, I'm terrified of him. You're not going to do that if you're the commander. But again, it's coming back to this business of Napoleon was a gambler, remember. And he very often he'd won. Usually the gamble had paid off. He needed this quick victory. He's got, he's got to have a quick victory. It's the only thing that can save his throne is a quick victory. And he's, fingers crossed, He's hoping it'll work. It didn't. No. Well, it doesn't go all the Brits uh, or the Allied armies way, does it? There's a rather a disastrous cavalry charge, which there's a beautiful painting of the Royal Scots Greys charging like that. They're probably not going quite as fast as that, are they? Well, yeah, it's a famous painting, Scotland forever. There are some problems with it. First of all, the Scots Greys were actually in reserve <laughs> and weren't actually supposed to take part in the charge at all. But the commanding officer saw everybody else heading off for glory and promotion and medals so he thought well he better get involved as well so they weren't at the front they would have been covered in mud the horses would have been hot deep in mud i mean they might have been in a hack counter more likely been a trot actually and they'd have been covered in mud and those ridiculous tartan helmets most of them would have been blown off it's it's what it was um, painted of course by elizabeth thompson lady butler and she married butler was the brigadier commanding Cavalry and Aldershot in 1881, I think, was the, was the year she actually published the painting. And what she did was she got um, her husband's orderly to dig a trench. And she sat in the trench with her sketch pad and got her regiment of cavalry to gallop past her and gallop past her again. Do it again, would you? Sketching away. And then she went and painted in the, in the uniforms of the um, of Scots Greys. So that's how the painting came about. It's a wonderful painting. It's great. Historically, it's bollocks. <laughs> it's it's a lovely painting. It's a bit like the thin red line, which actually, funnily enough, was was uh, which is Crimean War, which just came out the same year. Funnily enough, and again, it's nonsense because no Russian ever got anywhere near the the British line, and the British by then are using the Enfield rifle musket, you know, range of fifteen hundred yards. They they'd slaughtered the Russians long before it ever got to Nil. But again, it's it's wonderful. It's motivation. I occasionally have asked to go up to um, the officers' mess 
on my old regiment, one of the battalions of my old regiment, to talk to recruits about the paintings. And there's a wonderful painting. Most of them, historically, are absolute rubbish. They're motivational. They're inspirational. You know, you say to the kids, right, this is what your grandparents did. This is what your great grandparents did, etc. Military art, most of it is not intended to depict something historically correct. It's designed as propaganda, inspirational, motivational. Some of you want to hang in your wall. Uh, but it, and I'm afraid, I'm afraid. Elizabeth Thompson's painting of um, Scotland Forever, the Scots Grace, wonderful painting. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There was a total cock-up. Well, a bit of a cock-up. Dernon's corps has, has attacked. Uh, the British infantry have got up and scattered them. And they're on their way back to the French line. And the heavy cavalry is sent in to sort them out, to, to finish them. What you did, if you were chased by a cavalryman, the best thing to do was to lie down because he couldn't get at you with his sword. So he'd go on and go after something a lot easier. But it took a bit of guts to do that. Most people actually ran. Uh, and you had some protection. You, you had your pack on your back. That gave you some protection. You had you generally a high collar protected your neck. You had a shako which protected your head. So if you're a cavalryman, and your infantryman is is on his feet, you ride past them and you slash back and, and you cut his head in two. Now, had the cavalry chased them down probably as far as the, the bottom of the of the Anglo-Dutch hill and then come back, then that would have been fine. But of course they didn't. And there's a there's a wonderful letter from a private soldier in, in one of the cavalry regiments that was involved, one of the heavy cavalry regiments. Uh, that was involved in this charge for two two brigades. And he says, an officer passed me crying, on to Paris. And they they didn't come. And they, the recall was being blown time and time again, and they just didn't pay any attention. They got into the French gun line and started dealing out death and destruction to the gunners, which is a good idea. But Napoleon spotted what was happening and deployed a regiment of lancers. Now, the British didn't have any lancers. By this time, incidentally, the majority of the Lancers were French, not Polish, although originally the idea had been Polish. And, uh, of course, the Polish Lancers, or the, the Lancers, mainly French, caused a fair bit of mayhem uh, amongst the, the British cavalry. Uh, the result was that there were an awful lot of horses without cavalrymen and cavalrymen without horses, and really that was the end of the, of the heavy cavalry. So is it true to say, you've heard this before, the British cavalry... Are the best cavalry in the world, but the worst led? I think to say the first led, worst led is probably a bit unfair. Some of them, and Stapleton Cotton was, was a brilliant cavalry leader who was the, who commanded the, the cavalry in the peninsula most of the time. The worry was, and this is not just amongst the British on any army, go back as far as you like. If you're on a horse, you get to the loot first. And the tendency was, you do your business with chopping up the enemy and then you push off, try and find their baggage, find their loot. And you can do that if you're on a horse. It's a bit more difficult for the infantry. And, and this was the problem, that um, the cavalry would, would put in a wonderful charge and then they'd disappear over the horizon and not come back till tea time. And, and Wellington was always fulminating about this, that they weren't under control properly. And this, this frequently happened. But, but there were some cavalry commanders who, who did know what they were about. Was Uxbridge one of those? Yeah, Uxbridge wasn't wasn't bad, actually. But him and Wellington... I mean, Rux, Uxbridge uh, commanded a very good... Uh, when the British army is retiring or retreating, if you like, uh, withdrawing from Quatre Bras back to Waterloo, uh, the rear guard is commanded by Uxbridge personally with the 7th Hussars and a battalion of rifles and some horse artillery. And he does that exceedingly well. Now, I know what you're going to say, that he didn't he didn't uh, serve in the peninsula because he'd run off with the wife of Wellington's brother. Correct. That's not why he didn't serve in the peninsula. He didn't serve in the peninsula because he was senior to Wellington. And, and you just couldn't do that. By the time of Waterloo, Wellington is a field marshal and senior to Uxbridge. Therefore, Uxbridge is quite happy to, to serve with him. I don't think Wellington was terribly worried about the fact that he pushed off with the wife of his brother. Wellington wasn't terribly censorious about, about um, Ugandan matters, really. 
Yeah, well, he himself was... Um... Oh, no, 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 no. Now, Andrew Roberts and I have huge arguments about this. But Wellington was not pole vaulting all over the place. People say, oh, well, he took on the mistress of Napoleon. No, he didn't. He got involved, got involved with the Polish mistress because of music. She was a, she was a singer, she was an opera singer. Wellington was, was musical. His father was a professor of music at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, he himself played the violin. He was a musical chap. That's what he was interested in. And they say, oh, well, he had an affair with Napoleon's sister. No, he didn't. He negotiated with Napoleon's sister because Napoleon's sister owned the building that became the British embassy. So when, uh, for, for a brief period, uh, Wellington was the British ambassador in Paris after the Romans came back, um, before he goes off to the Congress of Vienna, he negotiated to get the building, which is to this day, the, the British embassy. There's, and, and, and his mother for a while was in Paris. His mother was a, was a prod from Northern Ireland. She would never have countenanced any any shenanigans of that's the right word. No, I, I don't. I think I think he was absolutely fa faithful, faithful to his wife, despite the fact the marriage was a disaster. Really, he liked the company of intelligent women. So do we all. Doesn't mean we're sleeping with them. You know, I I, I really do not believe that uh, was having it away outside marriage. I I could be wrong, but um, okay, I, there's no evidence. So uh, we mentioned the the sort of disastrous cav British cavalry attack. Then the French N Ney Marshal Ney makes a, another mistake, and he sends his own cavalry in, and that's a disaster. Isn't, isn't that is a total. Disaster. Am I getting this in the right order, though? Tell me yes, if you I'm are. Yes, you are. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The French cavalry is sent in. Now, what you, what all the books said, and and Jomini was was the sort of tactics book that everybody read, French and and British. And what it said was that when you're attacked with cavalry, you you send the cavalry in, the infantry will then go into square because that was the standard defense against cavalry. And no horse will gallop at something it can't go round or jump over. Uh, you put you out in the hunting field, if you put a horse at a bloody great hedge, you might go over it, the horse will not. So if you're in square, you're perfectly safe, provided you stand. So what you did was you used cavalry to force the infantry into square. Following up the cavalry is artillery, and the artillery then blasts the square to bits. And following the artillery is the infantry who go in and administer the coup de grace. And Ney didn't do that, partly because the cavalry divisions who did have their own artillery, the cavalry divisions artillery was taken away from them to boost up what Napoleon called the, the Grand Battery. This was this was a great big, every sort of gun he could get. Is that part of the 250 <laughs> cannon that, that yeah. fired the initial yeah. barrage, right? Yeah, and, and the, he made one, infantry division still had their artillery, but there was a there was one great big uh, artillery battery, which did, really didn't achieve what, what he thought it was going to achieve. So the cavalry divisions had lost their artillery, so there was no artillery following up, there was no infantry following up. Uh, and therefore, as long as the Allies stood in their squares, which they did and no case was a square broken. I can only think of one case, and that was in Garcia Hernandez. Yes, uh, at, after Salamanca, when a a square was uh, was broken. Uh, it was actually a French square broken by the by the Prussians. But that was that one square was caught sharp sword. I think I have no idea what sharp. Did. <laughs> I, the problem, the trouble is, I am red sharp. I daren't. I've read one sharp book because I was asked as a historian to review it from a historical point of view. And I thought it was very good. It was the one about uh, the siege of uh, Badajoz. Oh, yeah. It's Sharp's really, Company. The reason I do not read, I would love to, when I retire, I should read them all. Daren't read him. Daren't read. Um, Alan Mallison. No, 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 not Mallison. The, the naval chap. Oh, Hornblower. Or... Patrick O'Brien. No, Patrick O'Brien. Patrick O'Brien, yeah. Patrick O'Brien. Now, the reason I can't read them is that if you ask me a question and I give you an answer, did I get that from the Admiralty records or did I get it from Patrick O'Brien? So I dare not read any fiction that that impinges on what I do professionally. The dangerous game to play, I suppose. So, so I, I'm just make absolutely sure I don't. Uh, and my such little fiction as I have time to read, which isn't very much, is is Terry Pratchett and and, and that, that sort of thing. Just when I'm retired, I'm going to read all of Patrick O'Brien, I mean, all of Cornwall's, etc. But but not yet. So um, 
Why were they? Yes, There's co- only one animals. incidence of a of, of a it's square the being thing. broken. The the, uh, the 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 that one of the squares hadn't formed square and the uh, King's German Legion cavalry got in amongst them and another square the attacker horse was shot fell on the front rank created a gap and in they got but on that I know of no occasion there was I think much later on in history I think Abu Clay was there a square broken but yeah. not in the period 1807 to or 1792 to, to 1815 square never broken Napoleon had gone off, wasn't feeling well. He'd gone off to Rossom to lie down for a bit. When he came back and discovered what Ney was doing, he said, what's he doing? What's he doing? This is crazy. And, because and he, did Napoleon have piles? Well, the, 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 uh, the post-mortem didn't identify piles. And I think if you can make your enemy look ridiculous, you've achieved something. So Napoleon had piles. Now, I have to say I've never had piles. Some of my friends have had piles. They tell me it's very, very painful, but everybody thinks it's funny. Uh, it's the same as saying Hitler was a house painter. Hitler painted paintings in which there were houses. He was not an interior decorator. <laughs> but again, if you can dismiss him, he's a mere house painter. The has got piles. Um, you know, that's, that's uh, Catherine the Great uh, had sex with a horse. Uh, it's all nonsense. But it it makes your enemy seem rather more vulnerable less important, less frightening than he is. So as I say, the, the post-mortem, and there were a number of post-mortems, some carried out by British surgeons, some by French surgeons, none of them say anything about piles. There is still discussion. He probably died of stomach cancer. That's what killed his father and killed his sister. And uh, there were certainly signs of that on the post-mortem. But there are still people who say, ah, oh, he was assassinated by the British. Why? Why would the British want to assassinate? He was assassinated by French royalists. Why? He was away in St. Helena. So it's, it's most unlikely. Oh, he there was cyanide in the wallpaper. There are all, all sorts of theories. There's no there's no indication, no evidence that he, that he had piles. Although, bear in mind, he had been in the saddle for either in his unsprung coach or on a horse for four days all the way from Paris. Uh, so he'd have been he'd have been pretty tired, and there was there there is some indication again he may have been suffering from tertiary syphilis. That that's one of the theories, and there are some indications that 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 may have been the case. Um, sudden mood swings, for example, on occasions loss of balance. Uh, these are these could all point to tertiary syphilis. But again, is that propaganda? I think certainly, was he ill at the battle? Well, he was certainly not at his best. The old magic actually had gone, I'm afraid, at this at this point. Yeah, it's it, it's always extraordinary to me that he so underestimates his enemy, whereas I guess he had, he had underestimated the Russians, I suppose, as well. So Yeah, I mean, the big mistake was in 1812, going off to, to Russia, um, you know, half a million men, 20,000 of them, Poles, Germans, all sorts of people. I mean, his mistake there, actually, was he should have gone on after Borodino, or he should have wintered, possibly. If he'd wintered and then gone... In Smel- in, Smolensk or something. Smel- he could have wintered in Smolensk. Actually, it, was probably, it was probably what he should have done mm. um, and gone on the next year. But again, that means he'd been away from Paris. And if you're a dictator and your dynasty is not entirely legitimate or is suspect... You don't want to be away from the seat of power for too long. So again, that might not have worked. Mm. Uh, but, but that was a disaster, really. What was it that lost him Waterloo? Was there a particular a- attack that failed that lost him the battle? Or was it simply because the Prussians appeared when Wellington wanted them to appear? And therefore, yeah. that was that was really what beat Napoleon. Yes. Uh, I mean, as I said, I think he'd lost it on the 16th at Ligny when he allowed the Prussians okay. to go north. Having done that, the Prussians, of course, send a corps, followed by another corps, and they get in behind Napoleon's position. And once that happens, actually, that's that's it. Now, he tries to pretend that uh, when people see these, these Prussians appear from way over on the right flank, on Napoleon's right flank, appearing out of the woods, he initially says, it's Grouchy, it's Grouchy. He knew bloody well it wasn't Grouchy. 
So when actually cannonballs, Prussian cannonballs start falling, there's a great cry of treason, you know, because there's this still this suspicion in the army uh, of treason. I mean, after all, right on the first day when they cross the French border, General Beaumont deserts to the Allies. So there's 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 suspicion. And but you said they were French. And they're, they're firing us. What, what what's happening? You know, and really that was that. And as I've said before, if the Prussians weren't going to appear, well, he wouldn't have fought the battle. He, he's got no time. He didn't maneuver to somewhere else. Napoleon's got to, and yes, you're right, he did underestimate Wellington, but actually it wouldn't have mattered. He, he He's a gambler. He's got to get a quick victory, and, and therefore he's going to go for it and, and keep his fingers crossed and hope for the best, and it, it, it didn't work. And, and so the numbers... We're running out of time, I think. But the numbers that were killed at the battle it was huge numbers, really. And you, am I right in saying you don't see these kind of numbers until a hundred odd years later in World War One in Europe? They were the numbers were great compared to what had gone before. I mean, I think the total number of, of British killed were about sixteen hundred. A lot of senior officers were out killed or wounded because those are the days you led your men from the front. They were. They actually aren't. You're looking at them now. You think, well, that's not bad. I mean, it's 10 percent, just a little bit over than 10 percent. But if you remember that the maximum number of dead in any of the Peninsular War battles, I think it was 900 and something at the siege of Badajoz, but that went on for, for days. So when you suddenly get this number killed, it seems an awful lot. In one day. In one day. And it seems it seems a lot. Um, I think the next biggest was Alboera, which was one day, and that was 400 and something killed. So suddenly 1,600, that's, that's a lot. And of course, it's not that far away. You know, it's only across the channel. In, in terms of total men and horses, of course, a huge amount of horses killed. And it did take them three days to get the wounded off the fields. You still, I mean, in the days when Hougemont Farm was occupied, the, the farmer there was a lovely old boy. And I used to occasionally bring a bottle of scotch to allow me to go in and take people in there. And he used to give me all sorts of stuff that he'd plied up, you know, buttons and buckles and, and um, all that sort of stuff. You're not allowed, of course, to, to go metal detecting over the over Waterloo. And of course, the battlefield has changed quite a bit because to build the Lion Mound, which has got the Prince of Orange on it, who got wounded at Waterloo, later, of course, King of the Netherlands, they shifted about eight feet of the surface of Wellington's right centre to build that mound. So the ground has actually changed quite a bit. But I've no doubt that if you um, if you went down the French line, which really hasn't changed very much, there's probably an awful lot of stuff still there. And for a long time, of course, people who could afford it could buy Waterloo teeth, false teeth. Uh, the best false teeth were made from real teeth. And the old dentists were out there getting the teeth from the corpses. To make false teeth and, and Waterloo teeth, as they were known, were the best form of um, false teeth in those days. You remember, this was a time when there was no dental hygiene. Toothache, you pulled the tooth out. And right up, actually, until the, certainly until the 1910s, 19, probably First World War, pre First World War, as a 21st birthday present, you got all your teeth pulled out. Now, that was admittedly amongst the, probably the lower orders, not necessarily the, the, the upper classes, but that that was quite common. You pulled all well, just to save you having toothache later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I didn't. Which know is that why then. to join the army, to join Wellington's army, one of the medical requirements, and there weren't very medical requirements. I mean, flat feet, wet the bed didn't matter. <laughs> you had to have four teeth, two in the top, two in the bottom, because the only way you could open the way you opened your cartridge, which was wrapped in paper, was you you opened it with your teeth, and you put some powder in the pan, closed the pan, poured the rest of the powder down the barrel, followed by the ball, followed by the paper, and you rammed the whole lot down. Now, if you had no teeth, which was very, very common in those days, you couldn't be a soldier. So, right. I have, I have one final question for you, Gordon. At the end of the battle, yep. there, and it, it's obvious that all is lost. Yep. Is it true that the French shouted out when, when being demanded of, of a surrender, they, they shouted out, merde? No, uh, no, no, he didn't. The great legend was that um, the commander, the the Imperial Guard, Napoleon's Imperial Guard, did form a square to allow Napoleon to escape. 
And the theory is that the British rode up to the square and said, um, surrender. And the commander is said to have shouted, Merd, who was General Cambron. Now, the problem with that, the story then got changed uh, because of the sensitivities of, of ears to uh, Cambron saying, uh, La garde re mort, mais ne sont pas. La garde recule, mais ne sont pas. The guard retires, but it doesn't surrender. Um, the problem about that was that Cambron had already been captured by, and I can't remember the name of the cavalry officer who captured him, but it, it grabbed him by the aguillette and, and, and he was captured. So, so he couldn't have been in the square saying merde or anything else. But for a long time afterwards, people talked about le mot Cambron because you wouldn't say shit. Uh, you say le mot Cambron. But it's 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 a lovely story, but, but it's almost certainly not true. Oh, that's a shame. Well, Gordon, that's been absolutely wonderful stuff and the when, when did your book come out by the way oh it came well it, the hardback came out in 2014 which is what they wanted a year before and then the paperback came out on the actual anniversary of the battle in 2015 yeah. got a very good review by the spectator funnily enough and the spectator is normally a bit sniffy about military history but um they gave it a very good re review so that sort of helped sales considerably <laughs> Oh, good. Yeah. Well, it's it it is one of the. I mean, I don't know. It's probably my favourite Napoleonic era battle, just because it's epic in size. Mm. And you've just described it brilliantly today. So I recommend all the listeners go and get the book. I'll put a link in the show notes, Gordon. This has been fantastic. Thank you very much, Oliver. Always good to talk to you. Thank you very much for listening. Please do rate, review, and subscribe, and tell your friends if you can. Plenty more content coming up. Until then, thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs>